we're going to start with the absolute basics. You, know, you may think, show me something interesting, I know, I know the basics. You may think you know this stuff, but the, uh, the human thing is we don't know what we don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And if you don't understand this stuff, this basic stuff properly, it's going to come up and bite you later. I can guarantee it. So we're going to do everything, we're going to build a foundation properly. Everything is based, on, every sophisticated thing is based on these basics. So we set the foundations. And we're going to start with timing and spacing. Two entirely separate things, which often get smudged together. And I've heard great animators arguing about the timing when they're talking about, when they really talking about the spacing, or arguing about the spacing when they're really talking about the timing. So we're going to separate these two. I got my first big lesson from Grim Natwick, the great animator who animated uh, half of the princess in Snow White. So we'll find out what timing and spacing are, the difference between the two things, and we'll make it absolutely clear. Somebody put me on to Grim Natwick, who was then 90, and Grim, uh, Grim made it to 100, and, and uh, he had a big party in Hollywood. Of course, he, he never knew any, they never knew him because he was so old. And he was a wonderful raconteur. He designed Betty Boop, and he was in animation all the way from the very beginning through Snow White, and, and then he worked with me in the end, till he was 92 or something. And after his 100th birthday party with these 500 adoring animators in Hollywood, he rung up Chuck Jones, who he knew, as a little boy, <laughs> he said, I'm not going to go for 200. <laughs> so he was a very, very old guy. And he was an Olympic jumper, and he had these giant arms and great big shoulders, even when he was 90. So I must have met him, he was 89 or something. And I'll never forget it. It was in a Hollywood uh, basement, the kind of fir trees, and the, and the twilight, uh, the golden twilight's coming in the window, so half of it's in blue shadow, and half's in the, twi in the orange twilight, and these big spatula hands. And I said, I was asking, how do you, what, tell me about animation, tell me how it, what, tell me what, if you could boil it down, what would you say it is? I mean, can you boil it down? And he says, well, animation, it's all, it's all in the timing and in the spacing. It's all in the timing and in the spacing. Strange. The Americans should have developed it. No, that was it. So, if we use this, the horrible old bouncing ball example, well first, let, yeah, let's, we're gonna have the ball hit here, 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 and here. So this is going to be boink, 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 boink. So it's going to go donk, 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 donk. Make that one closer. Boink. Okay, that is, let me do this in red, that is the timing. Okay, I mean this is such an obvious old thing, but I don't think people, th I certainly didn't, separate the two. When he says timing and spacing, I could never tell which was the spacing, which was the timing, which is which. The timing is the, the hits. Doink, 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 whatever. The spacing is the, the ball, if it squashes, you know, whatever. It goes up here and of course it's slowing in the middle of the arc. The spacing is more close together and then it's down here, thunk, and Okay, so this overlapping, it's overlapping up here, 
and of course it's further apart there as it's going faster. So this is a soft ball ring, doink, 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 doink. And that of course is the spacing. So when we're doing a complex character, such as me talking, and I'm going dump, dump, bump, the timing is the dump, dump, bump, right? The spacing is all the junk that's going on in between here. So <laughs> let's be over, I'll overdo it. Dunk, dunk, dunk. Is the clusters, uh, are these things overlapping? Are they close together in here and then they're going far apart here? That's the spacing. So the most complex piece of action is just a combination of the timing and the spacing of it. Obviously, if the drawings are closer together, the ball will move slower. And when the drawings are further apart, the ball's moving faster. Here's a great way of showing the difference between timing and spacing. This coin takes one second to go across the screen. It's going across in even spacing. Now, let's take it across with uneven spacing. But it still goes across in one second. The same timing, but very different spacing. Now let's see them both together. And we see something very interesting. Although it doesn't look like it, they start at the same time and they end at the same time. Everybody here has a natural sense of timing, especially if you're athletic or if you're musical, because ti timing's built right into us. But the spacing for animation, we have to learn. And uh, this is what we're going to achieve in this session. It takes a while, but, you, but you'll get it. This is the same bounce that we've seen before. A small hard ball. And here it is with its spacing positions. The spacing creates the feel of a small hard ball. Now here's a squashy cartoon one. And here it is with its spacing positions. Now this is a larger, slightly soft ball. And here it is with its spacing positions. Now this. We're just using a circle, but it's how we space those circles, how we cluster them that creates the illusion. In this case, a heavy bowling ball. Here's a light ping pong ball. We know it's light because of the timing and the spacing. This one weighs almost nothing at all. Now let's take out every other drawing making it twice as fast. Let's try it with an object. The chart. There was a 
if we take um, Mickey Mouse or something, or most of the day, they all look the same at the time, and he's moving from here to here with the head, okay, and the hand is up here, and it's going to go down into here. And say he's got a tail that's going from there, and it's going to go down into here. You know, we have these charts on the drawings, right? Telling you the spacing of the drawings. They are either here or here. Grimm would have a, he would do an arc. You'd think that would be an arc. And then he'd put a little chart on it. Um, say it's like this. You know, it's just slowing into that. And then you have a different one on the nose. Uh, maybe it was like that. And then you have an ev even one on the tail. And you have these little charts on the drawings. Everything doesn't happen at once. Our generic mouse is going to move the hand, the head, and the tail at different speeds. This is why they developed separate little charts. Different charts for different parts. The nose is going down uneven. The finger goes down, easing out and easing in, uneven. Say the tail goes down, even. Each part has different spacing, but it all takes place in the same amount of time. They put different charts for different parts, so that everything didn't happen at the same rate. This loosened things up. So it isn't like a robot, you know. So you break everything up. Is that clear? Ken would always make me, I, I would always try to start drawing because that was what I felt most comfortable with. And he said, no, God damn it. He said, do the timing. And he would make me, um, I don't want to get on the exposure sheet yet. But if this is a, this is a classic Disney sheet, four seconds, everybody knows what these things look like, computer guys. They're just four seconds on the page or six feet. And Ken would say, look, where does he hit the ground there? Mark it. There's your accent. When, and where's your next hit? OK, here. OK. And you got two little hits here and here. OK. Now put another drawing here. Get that hit. And I would have to do these important drawings. Right? So he'd say, come on, Dick. No drawing. Get a stopwatch or a metronome and let's act it out. And he'd make me act it out, whatever it was. Da, 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 da. And you say, no, do it again. And I have to do it again and again and again until I had it clear in my mind what I wanted and, and he had it clear in his mind. And he said, those are the hits. So he's doing the timing first. Then he's going to go in and animate it once he's got his keys. But we're coming to that. This is how the chart, <laughs> what I'm trying, how it got over to this part of the field. Every, everything will get clearer as we go. But, um, for those of our, us that don't, aren't familiar with animating on paper, these two drawings are going to be on separate sheets of paper. Yeah. Then where do the charts end up? Where do the charts go up? I mean, you're drawing them on one plane. On, on one page, either the first one or the last one. Okay. We, we would draw it on. And you put the one. frame numbers? Yeah. Okay. And we might, we of course would probably put in some more drawings before we handed it to some poor assistant. Okay. I wanted to yeah, do. that's how I don't sure. know how you guys do that. <laughs> yeah, well, we don't do it necessarily this way. <laughs> Maybe we should. This is the history of charts. But whether you're drawing this or creating this in the computer, the principle is the same. Different parts move at different speeds. I was lucky enough to know this guy, Dick, Dick Humor which is odd. He was a Disney story member. His name was spelt like this. And he was one of the main first story guys on Snow White. And uh, he and Joe Grant were the story people on Dumbo. And he was also co-storied Fantasia and everything. But he had been the top 
New York animator doing Mutt and Jeffs in sort of 19, I don't know, in the 20s. And Dick was a, a good draftsman, and he also did comic strips, made a rather good, um, rather good drawing and stuff. And he was the leading, leading uh, animator. And he would, uh, he'd do all the drawings. If he was doing drawing one, and he would just do drawing one, two, three, four, and five, right? And, and the head of the studio, Van Buren or whoever it was, said, gee, Dick, the work's wonderful, but we, we wish we could get more of it. And so Dick said, well, if you give me somebody else to put in here, um, to put in two and four, put in these in, in, the in-between drawings, I'll uh, put in the in uh, I'll get twice as much work done. So that was the invention. Dick invented the in-betweener. <laughs> said, because they used to just work kind of straight ahead, you know, just drawing things. And, and then he would just do every other drawing. And then some other, or several people, could just put in the in-between ones. If we have, drawing one is our extreme. I'm calling this an extreme. Not a key, this is important. Okay. I'm doing, as we're doing here, the one in the middle, for purposes of this class, I would like to call the breakdown. We spell it this way, we just break down, break down, we minute, break. And we underline it. And that's number three. Okay, and number two and number four are just plain in, in betweens. If you want to be intellectual about it, an extreme is wherever you get a change of direction. It's, it's, or, or you could say when you start an action or end an action. Let's do it again, calling it number nine. We we'll just have. We're doing drawing one, an extreme, number nine, an extreme. <laughs> Make the one in the middle is five, the one in the middle, which would be the breakdown. One in there is four. Six, and then you got seven, eight. Doesn't matter, you put them above or below. Three. Okay. And this is what they call in the trade the slow. <laughs> That's the slow out. We're slowing out of drawing one, and we're slowing in to draw, you've, we've put the one in the middle, smack, important drawing, and then we're slowing in to drawing nine. I always get balled up with slowing out and slowing in. I think of them backwards and everything. The best way is the way the computer guys talk. You talk about easing in and easing out. It's much better, isn't it? Ease out and ease in. We can show this with a pendulum. Here's the arc that the pendulum will swing in, and here's the breakdown or passing position. Add in-betweens. This is what it looks like when you don't have an ease in or an ease out. Now we add a slight ease in and ease out both ends. And it's more convincing. Now we'll add in two more positions. Gives us a nice result. But four more positions gives us an even better result. 
and we get a really nice ease in and ease out. Let's do it with a finger. We're easing out of drawing one. Same thing, easing out of drawing one with more in-betweens. Now we're going to ease in to drawing five, cushion in. Now we'll ease in with more in-betweens added. Now we're going to ease out of the first position and ease in to the second position. We'll add in-betweens and it'll be even clearer. Ken Harris always, he, he thought terribly simply. And he would just say, he would say, we're cushion, cushioning. This would be cushioning. And somebody throws you a baseball and you catch it. He'd say, well, cushions. You know, you just cushion. So you're slowing in or easing in. Boom. I, I saw, Cali I've seen California animators do, do uh, almost as bad as this. If this is a Panavision screen, Panavision paper, they will do this. That's drawing one, and that's drawing uh, 96. <laughs> Let's make it 196. <laughs> and they'll put a chart on this thing. <laughs> And they go play tennis, you know. And you say, Jesus, look terrible. The assistant, the assistant's no good. The assistant's no good. Absolute rubbish, you know. I gave it to him. I gave it to him. I know my job, you see. <laughs> Incidentally, most actions in life are on an arc. They follow arcs. Unless you're doing something in a straight line, like a punch. Arcs are beautiful to watch. Straight lines give power. A pendulum eases in and out and follows an arc. Not like this. How are we going to in between these positions? Do we join them up like this? Usually, we get something half-assed, something like this. Neither one thing nor another, because the in-betweener doesn't understand arcs. When we really wanted this. Just this lifting arm follows three arcs. The elbow, the wrist, and the tips of the fingers. I got a job at UPA, and immediately after two or three weeks as head of trays and paint, I then, and they found I could animate. And then they said, well, you have to have an assistant. So they gave me a very, quite a skilled artist. And uh, Charlie was my assistant. And Charlie was, he was good. He was a good guy, but Charlie didn't like. I, I, Charlie would do, so I'll do it in color, just, just to make it clear. Charlie would do a nice little drawing right in the middle, between one and three. Uh, and he'd get the hair just right. And he'd do a nice drawing in here. Just a little, whoops. But Charlie didn't like 
the way Leo Salkin, the head of the studio, had designed the eyeballs, see? Charlie liked eyeballs that were like this. <laughs> so for about 30 seconds of material, when, when it came out, <laughs> you had the eye, eyes on the screen doing this. Everything else was going hello there, and it was going all the time. So I started doing all the drawings myself and got Charlie to work with somebody else, and, and, uh, and I didn't learn until many years later how to use an assistant, because I was terrified of this happening again. And we had it on the rabbit, because we were hiring people coming in off the street. Um, there's drawing one, this is drawing five of a coffee cup, which say is in the live action actor's hand. And the in-between, say the, the breakdown is a good drawing. The one in the middle would be like this, because the guy didn't know anything about perspective. So, of course, you're going to get that on the screen. I mean, it was wild. Sometimes you'd even have them like that, because they didn't know perspective. Well, you see it all the time on bad animation, isn't it? I mean, Milt, when he went to Disney, uh, early on, he was, this would be 1934, I think, he went, and he met the great Bill Teitler, and, Teit and, and he said, I, how do you do, you know? And he said, I'm in the, uh, I'm in the assistant pool, and, and tight, or the in-between pool or something. And uh, Teitler says, oh yeah? How many scenes did you cock up lately? And that's how they were, these tough, tough guys. So, wobble. So you could say the assistant work is really volume control. You know, just throwing that in. The, the, um, it's not, with, our, with the graphic stuff, it's not line quality, although that may be important on a commercial. It's where you put those lines to hold those volumes together. Assistant work is is basically volume control. And so should the animator. We're controlling the volumes as this hand, Marvel Comics style, goes around like in a Spielberg movie, and they go, ah, to get you. Well, that can't be wobbling. That's got to be consistent as it turns. So you've got to be able to handle the volumes. Um, OK, there's. Uh, just incidentally, if you're doing, a, if an animator's doing this drawing, one is, is, is extreme, he's going to number four. If he's going to do position, he's going to put two in thirds, divisions 33 and a third percent of the way towards there. He should not do that to the assistant. That's not fair. He should at least do drawing one and two, say, himself, and leave the assistant or in between, to, to drop one in between those two. It's, it's, it's not going to work leaving what they call thirds like that. Or he should draw one and uh, three, so the assistant can drop the one equal divisions in the middle. So that's all. If the animator's lucky enough to have an assistant, he still does enough work to have ironclad control over the scene. This stuff may all seem very basic, but you will see how damned important it is when we start putting it all together in a sophisticated way. If we don't get this basic stuff right, we're going to build our house on a shaky foundation. Let's review. We've shown the difference between timing and spacing. We've shown how the chart was born. We've shown about easing in and easing out. We've shown volume control and arcs. Now the next session we'll be building on this. We'll, we'll start a scene and we'll find out what do you do first? Then what do you do? What do you do after that? Then what's the third, what's the fourth, what's the fifth thing that you do? We'll tackle the work method, the ideal work method, and how to organize our material. Thank you.